You're listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast where we introduce you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. Before we jump into this episode, we'd like to give special thanks to POP, peopleofplay.com, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Without them, this podcast would not be possible. You are listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast that introduces you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. I am artist and engineer David Yakos. And I'm game designer Branson Faustini, and together we get to ask questions to the people who made the world of fun. And today we get to talk to the people on the other side of the table. We've been talking with a lot of game inventors, designers, uh, but today we've got a special guest, uh, Josh West. Josh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, well, we're honored to have you. Uh, so a <laughs> little bit of background about Josh. Josh is the head of product development and inventor relations for ThinkFun, uh, based out of Washington, D.C. And, and uh, I guess a little bit of background just to build a little framework for, for listeners about ThinkFun so they know where you're coming from. Uh, I guess Think Fun was formed in, I think, 1985, back when wrestling was real. And uh, by Bill Ritchie and Andrea Barthello. And uh, they wanted to meld the world of educational games and fun. Uh, and is that, is that how you'd kind of put it, Josh? What's, give us a little bit of background of, of what's, what's sure. Think Fun. Sure. Sure. Happy to. So, um, Bill and Andrea, who are a, a, a wonderful set of people, um, they started doing very, and, and they will proudly say this, that they started doing very normal careers. And it was actually sometime in the 80s when on the same day, and I'm not telling anything that they don't proudly admit to, from the same company, Bill was fired and Andrea quit. And they basically said, okay, you know what we could do? Uh, is make these great puzzles. And it was uh, Bill's background in particular. Uh, his, his father, I believe, uh, worked for Bell Labs. or they ha I know they had a connection to Bell Labs. I, I believe that's it. I hope I'm not speaking. Um, but so he grew up, he and his brothers and, and, and their family grew up with just a lot of puzzly folks. And Bill and Andrea had this notion to found this company saying these are some really fascinating cerebral puzzles we could bring, we could be the people that bring them to the masses. And so the toys, um, you know, carry a little bit more of that thoughtfulness with that's them. Cerebral, uh, the cerebral connection with play. Some of the titles I, I'm guessing just about everybody has seen, if not played most of you know, some of these games, like, um, like rush hour, it's an entire line of different rush hour games uh, with Zingo math dice, uh, with circuit maze. It's a connection of that, that, uh, educational with with play. That's exactly right. Um, the the intent is, is is to do precisely that, but not educational. I mean, it, there are some exceptions to this. It, none of these are hard and fast rules, but in general, the education side, um, it's 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 teaching critical thinking skills. So all that is to say, while there are obviously you're practicing math facts with math dice. And their uh, Zingo, from a certain point of view, is an early reader game. However, a lot of them, it's more that you are practicing deduction and logical reasoning. It's just a great puzzle. So we're not necessarily, it's not as though you would play Circuit Maze and walk away and go, and now I have a PhD in history or I'm ready for MIT. But you are a little closer to those things because you've had the opportunity to practice that type of reasoning. When we did, we, when we developed Circuit Maze, that was, I'm, uh, fortunate to, I guess my first product was with ThinkFun back in the day when it came to the toy and game world, but uh, that led to Circuit Maze, and we did sneak in pretty much Circuits 101 into the play. <laughs> that was <laughs> trying to sneak in a little bit of that education behind puzzles was was the intent of teaching kids, you know, parallel and series circuits. Um, so, uh, what uh, when it comes to STEM toys, is there like some sort of secret sauce? when it comes to balancing that educational aspect with with play? There is, but it's less a recipe and more truthfully something that we seek. 
And what I mean by that is speaking to inventors or any inventors that are listening, it is something that we turn to the inventor community for. Now, we'll be deliberate when we pursue it, but it's not as though we could look at a, at a game that was purely fun and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and say, well, if we add our, if we run it through our usual process, we will end up with something that is equal parts fun and thoughtful. It, the invention sort of has to have that nugget when we start. Um, we definitely cultivate it. We certainly edit it, but we don't typically create it, um, which again, this is why I am employed to go and meet with inventors. Um, but it, it, we actually talk about it sometimes internally on a scale of think to fun. And some things go too much think, some things go too much fun, and there's nothing wrong with that. We just try to get it in the middle. Um, but as long as at the end of the day, the experience is rewarding, uh, that, you, that you get something out of it, that's, get something out of it that's specifically in a thoughtful way. I mean, any, any game you can, no matter what game you're sitting down with your family, you're going to have a good time, and you are thinking well, you're learning something. Um, but we, we do try to look for things that have a little bit more of that deduction, that STEM, that engineering, some facet of that. So we're saying, okay, you're doing all of that that we said, um, but you're going to take it just a little step further specifically in the train your brain way or ignite your mind with, has been our mantra for a long time. <laughs> all right. So let's for a moment, travel back in time. Um, <laughs> did you always uh, know that you wanted to work in the toy and game industry? Uh, what was uh, what was uh, Kid Josh thinking about what they wanted to do? Uh, was that always the plan? <laughs> well, Kid Kid Josh definitely uh, had aspirations of lion taming. Uh, that was big. See, I'm, I'm guessing um, Kid Josh had a beard from the time he was about nine. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, this is this is all natural. I've never not had this um, <laughs> prior to nine. You know, it, kids grow up at different rates. It, that, that's just that's life. Um, <laughs> after learning what uh, health insurance was and, and so which kind of took lion taming out of the running, um, not to you know, <laughs> disclaimer against any lion tamers in all seriousness, um, I knew that it was going to be design. I'd always wanted to do design that was, you know, there comes a time, I think, when you go through schooling and everybody sort of says, okay, well, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I honestly had no interest in answering the question. It was just, well, I mean, I want to see stuff and I want to do lots of stuff, but uh, I don't particularly want to focus. And at some point you had to, and I sort of was dragged kicking and screaming, not literally, of course. Um, and I was like, well, I guess I have to have a job. Um, and I stumbled into, um, for a long time, I, I really wanted to do animation. Um, animation, at least from my very early efforts into learning to do that kind of drawing, takes a little more perseverance and patience than I have. <laughs> um, you know, I have an, an 80s cartoon kid attention span, which is to say, like latch keys and cartoons and frosted flakes and that's what that'll do to you. <laughs> um, but I discovered industrial design and I really found that I enjoyed that mix of art and engineering and I know a lot of our colleagues have also found that love of you know being able to do some not by no means actual full-on engineering I get the difference but solving it through design thinking and when you do that, when you do industrial design, in general, it helps if you kind of have an area of focus. Well, I had been working in a mom and pop toy sh shop for years. Um, it, it started probably more in toys than games, although I've always been a gamer. Um, and there just really wasn't much of a choice. It was sort of like, well, if you got to design something, I mean, I use furniture, like I sit a lot. Um, <laughs> And there's other stuff, but if you can design toys, as he's looking around at this you know, collection of toys and games and whatever else, well, it was just sort of easy to make that jump and say, okay, well, I'm going to design those. And then it was, thankfully, there was something of a revelation to discover that there is actually a career field in that. 
Like step two <laughs> is to be like, could you actually do that? Or do they, do, you know, and, and no, contrary to popular belief, toys just don't come out of a basement in, you know, in some large corporation somewhere. There's actually a lot of people involved in designing them and creating them and making them and publishing them and so on and so forth. And so thankfully, I was like, okay, well, as long as some of those people are hiring at some point, we're, we're in, we're, we're in good. And that's <laughs> road were itself. There certain, uh, were there certain games and toys that young, young Joshy was playing with that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, uh, 100%. Like what, what, uh, what were the things that really grabbed your attention then? Well, the A number one Grand Pooh Bob Bull Moose winner, and I still have every single one of these, was the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe collection like i've got every single one there i mean they're, they're not kept well they have my name written in marker a la toy story on the bottoms of them because <laughs> otherwise you can't take them to after school care or whatever um but i still have all those that was that was the number one was just why between watching the television show and then going down and just enacting those kind of epic battles um Games, I get asked this a lot because I definitely do more toys and games now. I would say toys-wise, I was definitely an action figure kid. It wasn't just He-Man, but it was mainly He-Man. Um, games, there were a couple of favorites. Uh, growing up was one called Bizarre. It's a Sid Saxon game um, that just has this fun sort of trading mechanism with glass beads. There is a hard-to-find one that I particularly liked. It was an Alvin and the Chipmunks roll and move, but they had a pop matic bubble, <laughs> and they were on a deserted island, and there were these little plastic treasures, and you had to pop the bubble and you move around, but the island had booby traps on it. There was like a plastic palm tree that if someone was in this spot and you landed on the other one, the, you could make the palm tree fall and knock them over. There was a pirate's <laughs> plank. There was... A number of things that were like rigged, <laughs> and I, I that game is long since sold at a yard sale or something. But that was <laughs> routinely played, and then all the you know Candyland, Monopoly, Clue kind of traditional ones that they still make today. So the eighties had, you know, uh, uh, had kind of grows stuff. with you too. So. <laughs> What's that? The eighties had some good stuff. That was for sure. Yeah. I was I was very blessed. I had a I I truthfully did have a have a very happy childhood. So and they were filled with a lot of toys and games and a lot of being out in the woods. So, so being this uh this guy that had a hard time you know bringing down to a focus that finally landed on industrial design and said hey I could design toys and games like how did you make your way into into the industry of play? So I started, so I stayed with that, that mom and pop shop. In fact, the owner of that shop who is now retired and one of the managers are, I still very much think of as mentors. Um, they both had a knack for picking out toys and games that weren't going to show up in big box stores, but would be significantly popular as long as, you know, they got their moment on the shelf or their time for, for one of us as employees to show them to some parent asking for the next great thing for a five-year-old. So I learned a lot from doing that. Um, and I stayed with that shop for a long time, even part-time after I'd gotten employed. And I still bounce back there every now and then. Um, and I got linked up with uh, actually a kite company, Premier Kites and Designs out of Hyattsville, Maryland. And so very sort of toy and game adjacent um, in the industry, but definitely they straddled toys and games, but also there is a separate kite and uh, home decor industry. Um, but through that, I sort of did contract work and other kinds of uh, industrial design. And eventually I started, this is a true story, um, I left that company to pursue contract design and I would go to New York Toy Fair as Bob Martin, who is actually my godfather. But you, at the time you had to be industry to get in. And so he never went because they, or he and his wife got invited because they own a retail store or owned at the time uh, <laughs> that sold animation memorabilia. So they got invited, but they didn't typically go because there were maybe two vendors there that were applicable to them, but of course they cast a wide net. So he would let me register as him. I would go with my portfolio, get in the door, show the badge, and then immediately accidentally turn my badge around 
and then go around to booths and try to get work or, you know, grease palms, make contact. <laughs> so you're the reason um, that you have to you have to check in with an ID now. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, it's it's I mean, it's not me specifically. I can't I can't carry that whole banner, but it was um, Bob's fault. <laughs> it's you know, it's it's trouble. That's that's my that's my Steven Spielberg sneaking into the movie studio kind of story. Uh, but eventually I got linked up doing some design work with think fun and I was a contract designer there for a while until they said, would you like to come and just do this full time? And of course, internally I was going, yes, thank God. I'm so tired of peddling the freelance game. I full respect and love to anyone who does that, but it is hard. No joke. Um, so I was thrilled to get it and then had to act all cool and poker face like, well, yes, I suppose I could stop being a contract designer and come and work for you, um, which was, you know, which was, again, since the, the kites and some other uh, in-between contract jobs, that was that was my second job within the toy industry, and that's where I have been low these many years. <laughs> nice. So is there a, uh, you know, as, as inventor relations and designer, because you're wearing you're wearing two hats. Uh, you know, how do you juggle between those, those two different things? It's actually, um, it's one of, it's, it's probably my favorite part of what I get to do. Um, I, I have, I have a little bit of inventor envy. I, I like the idea and I fantasize that someday I may cross the table. Um, but for right now, I enjoy being able to sort of immerse myself in creatives and balancing that sort of, okay, I want to go and meet all these creative people and see their brilliant ideas. And then think fun has such a unique product offering that you do sort of get to straddle. I can, I can then take it in and say, okay, sometimes it comes to us, uh, ready to go. It's a brilliant puzzle. It's a brilliant game that has exactly the kind of thinking that we need. And so the questions are more about uh, industrial design and production. Um, sometimes very little, some, you know, however much is needed. And then sometimes you see a nugget of a great toy that's in that realm. And we think this would be so much fun if we can edit it or collaborate with the inventor, maybe bring in some of the other folks that we work with. We could potentially make this fantastic toy that has all of the STEM and thoughtfulness that Think Fun loves with its brand, but has this just unique play value that hasn't been seen before. Um, and so I enjoy that part of it. I mean, if anything, you know, I'm sure you both have encountered this. If anything, you, you want to do it more. You know, you wish there were more hours in the day, more time to just really <laughs> delve into these things. So um, it's it, it can be a struggle because, it you know, it's a lot of work. And, I, and thankfully, I have a lot of good people that I work with that are extremely talented, both in Think Fun and without. Um, and so it's it becomes very much a team effort to try and have everyone balance those two hats. That's how you make I mean, every now and then you lose a bet, and you're like, fine, we'll do circuit mains, whatever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's walk through the uh, sort of inventor relations process. Um, and that inventor relations is such a formally sounding <laughs> title. I, I really prefer Game Scout. <laughs> game game scout uh we've been called product acquisition we've been called um jerks uh, yeah. squasher of dreams maker of dreams squasher squasher dreams i like that one yeah. so at some point in this interview we can get into like okay things i would like the inventors to know <laughs> um, well, let's go into that <laughs> so certainly yeah. well um so the, the process, because uh, with Think Fun and, and now with Ravensburger, I should also mention Think Fun is officially uh, a, the brain and logic games category brand for Ravensburger Global, particularly Ravensburger North America, but Ravensburger Global. Um, and they've been really great to work with, I have to say. It's, it's been a struggle in the sense that you always learn there's challenges like with any sort of onboarding. Um, but they've been really great and very gracious and accommodating through the whole process. I'll get I'll get that plug safely in. Um, <laughs> keep going. This this is water, but you know if I get something stronger, I'll tell you the real story. No. Um, <laughs> you can leave that in. That's cool. Um, 
So the, the process is typically, and, and this is in terms of balancing those hats you mentioned, the process is, it, it can be hard to manage. It's, it starts out with finding inventors, trying to find new inventors, trying to find new ideas, trying to go to places where inventors and creatives will be and see if you can marry things that we are seeing as a potential trend, preferably a trend coming, with a good idea that's just really creative and makes product. Sometimes we see it coming and we can go in and, uh, as, as my boss calls it, fishing versus hunting. Sometimes you hunt, you have an idea. I can go to inventors that I feel would be good in that area and say, hey, I need, um, I need these kind of things. Can we work together? We can collaborate, and I, but I want this very specific concept worked out. And other times it's just uh, shoot the moon, baby. I, I, I just need the latest and the greatest. And that's definitely more of the scouting. And I think the challenge is kind of marrying that. And sometimes you just have to say, okay, this is awesome, but I have to put that down and do the other 50 to 60% of my job um, and focus on the design and getting the products made, getting them produced and getting them out. Um, but it definitely starts with, okay, what do you guys think people would want to play with that could be enriching <laughs> and cool? And if we can come up with that one, then we just got to go find it. <laughs> if I had an answer for you, boy. Like, <laughs> so uh, from the other side, let's say I was a, an inventor. I sign up for the Chi Tag People of Play conference. Um, mm -hmm. I get to sit across the table from you. As an inventor, how should I go about that that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're brand new, um, get my name right. That's a big one. Uh, I, I, I say that and we laugh. You'd be surprised how many things that I get are addressed to the wrong name. Um, but but in all honesty, it's not that big a deal. I'm, 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 I'm teasing. The, the real... The real thing that we are looking for, honestly, and okay, so I'm going to jump back to the comment I made to David. Thing that I wish that all the inventors, professional and otherwise, knew from our side of the table, and that is, I don't want to say no. There is this running gag, and there was a skit done at Chicago and Chi Tag one year that was hilarious, where they were introduced, those inventors kept introducing, and it was one person playing the inventor relations, and the pitches got shorter and shorter until the, you know, before the person said no, until the person just said, hi, I'm, and they just went no and moved on. I was like, <laughs> okay, I get that. That's funny. I do. I do. I totally get that. But the thing is like from where I'm sitting, I'm sent there to find our next big hit. I can't go to all these shows and then come back and go, nah, didn't see anything. No new products. I'm going to hang out at my desk though. Is that cool? <laughs> like, I don't know, you know, we didn't find anything. Like, I, I you know, I, we, we want to say yes. We all want to say yes. We want to find that one. And most of the time, the games that I see are very good. They're, they're fine. It's just that I'm looking for that one, like, okay, a little bit different that's going to fit just in our line that checks off a whole bunch of boxes and also has just something unique. And it's that something unique, I think, or that, you know, that whiz bang, we, we jokingly called it for a number of years, um, that you see that is really makes an amazing idea or an amazing toy. And it ha but it, it, it's even more than that because it has to be just the right level. Like I've, there are times when I've seen it and said, this is amazing. I would buy this. I need you to go sell it to a company that can publish it. Let me know when it is available. I will be the first in line. <laughs> but for us, for what I'm looking for, it's, it doesn't quite fit the bill. And so to get back to your initial question, probably one of the best ways that you can start other than just, you know, dotting your lowercase J's and um, being polite is just saying, okay, this thing, whatever this bit is, this is what's unique about what I'm showing you. This is the cool thing. This is this clever idea. David, I'll use one of yours. Um, the break in that you did with play monster like starting out of the gate and going like it's it's a reverse escape room. So everybody's doing escape rooms. So instead of getting out, you have these puzzles like a reverse Russian nesting doll that get in. That you, you get in. 
and we kind of heard that pitch and, and we talked about it afterwards and everybody was like, that's a really good idea. That is very clever. That's unique. Let's kind of control it. It didn't end up being right for us because we had kind of some other uh, similar product lines and hopper business reasons, blah, 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 bottom line. <laughs> didn't work. But it was a good way to kind of start off with this clever twist on that is a neat idea. So for some of the uh, the don't do's, like there, there's got to be a couple of things that people come to you and start to start to pitch. You know, it's like the hey, here's a here's how to play, and then they explain the rules for about an hour and a half. Like what what are some what are some other examples of the pitfalls that people should really avoid when they're trying to convey? Convey sure. Their imagination. Um, if you are this, this will be to new inventors. I'll 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 try and. Some of this I have to put in a white paper that I owe Mary Cousin for about six years now, I think. I'm way behind. <laughs> um, I hope she sees this. And Mary Cousin, I'm so sorry. I will, I will get you those white papers. I have them half written. Um, but uh, so new inventors versus seasoned inventors. For new inventors, one of the big ones is, as you say, um, I do still have new inventors that will sit down and start to tell me the story, the origin of where the game came from. And I always want to say, okay, that's really cool and I really appreciate it. This is not the time for that. You will know when the time for that is because someone will literally ask you, tell us how you came up with that game. That usually happens after it's been, or toy, that usually happens after it's been successful and you're being interviewed in some capacity. But initially, it's, it's like, I, again, I'm here as a representative of the company. I'm looking for new ideas. Let's get right to the heart of what makes your thing cool. And then the follow-up to that is if it's not right, if you say it and it's not right, it's probably not that I've missed something about it. If you've communicated well what the idea is, it isn't that I don't understand it. Um, it isn't necessarily that it's bad. Sometimes it's bad. Um, <laughs> but in most cases, it's a very good idea. It just may not be right for us. And then if you want to have that conversation, the next big one is if I see there's something there, or a lot of times I will see it, and this does happen especially with new inventors, where I'll see some ideas and go, okay, none of these are, are ready for prime time. However, I see in you someday we're going to be working together. Like these are some really good ideas. They're just not ready. So let's talk about what I am looking for. And maybe that's your cup of tea and you can say, I got it and I've got time and I will go home and I hear what you're saying and I will polish and let's get a, a, a rep rapport going so we can develop these. And sometimes it's, Hey, that's not my bag. I'm, I'm really a different kind of inventor. I'm doing different kind of products and that's fine too. But then we can say, Hey, great. Um, and I'm even happy to give you some names of my colleagues because, uh, we're very big believers. Most inventor relations are in kind of, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. So I am more than happy to even direct you to other companies that I might think where, you know, where, where you may stand to have a better home with your concept. I will. Side note, try to vet with those colleagues. Um, like give them a heads up, like, hey, can I send the name before you? That's just <laughs> being polite. That's professional courtesy. Don't take that personally. But I am going to ask them before I just hand an email address out. Uh, when you're talking about the whiz bang, like the wow factor of these things, uh, combining that with the pitch, you've got to be able to see this thing and get it within 30 seconds. It's, it's kind of like that a commercial that's maybe 30 seconds long, you've got a really good feeling as to how this is all played. You want to sure. touch on that a little bit more of like, like what is that presentation? Like what are some of the, the materials, some of the, the tangibles that somebody should have in, in hand like to, to get their imagination into your brain and within 30 seconds? What, how, is that, how is that done? Within 30 seconds. Honestly, um, you know, you can use a variety of different things. I've had people present, uh, we have bought, I have led the acquisition of everything from a full on working model that was done on a high end 3D printer that totally works. Um, to at the far end, I, we had one idea that the person just said it. It was at the end of a pitch and they just said, 
bleh, and I said, we're probably going to do that game. Let's continue <laughs> talking about it. That's a really good idea. And they, I mean, they had don't nothing. Don't do that. Just, don't yeah. just tell Josh Bland with the one idea. You want to be prepared. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the it, it happens with the former much more. It happens with the former much more than the latter. Um, but that's not to say it does happen. But it, to answer your question, getting in that nugget, um, it's it is the be- in my opinion, it is always the best way that you feel that you can communicate. And you got to be pretty judi- uh, pragmatic might be the better word or honest with yourself about what that is. Like you may think that it's explaining and maybe it is, but it also might not be. Um, sometimes it's a napkin sketch. Sometimes it's a working model. Sometimes it's, you know, the presentation of that. But it's got to be that, that essence or that core idea that has not either been thought of or has not been presented in this way that when I see it, we're already like 60% there. The other 40% will be the finite details, but your, your short story, your elevator pitch, whatever thing you want to call it, that idea is really clever. We've got a, a lot of the seasoned veterans that, that listen and know what type of materials to put together to show this to show an idea, but for those that are kind of just starting out, maybe you can list a couple of, what are the tangible assets that somebody should have when they're wanting to present an idea? Tangible assets that you want to have when presenting an idea. Um, You definitely want to have, again, the best description possible of why you think it's going to, uh, it, it will be successful. And uh, in terms of tangible, it can be a written description. I will push you for a picture. Picture is, is worth a thousand words. So you figure two pictures, that's a 2,000 word essay. You would be surprised how descriptive that is. And if you can't draw it, I completely respect that. Um, you can cut it out of a magazine. You, like, you'd be surprised <laughs> what you can find on the internet that with a little, with some scissors and paste, I mean, preschools have been doing this for generations, you can get your idea across. Um, oh, it's important nice. our videos uh, for people making videos to present these ideas to you. No, v- uh, videos are great as well, and you can even fake those. I think you did one of these with Dan Klitzner. Oh yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. He, he like the that story video. I mean, he made that well, the, yeah, right. With about Bop it when he talks about making the little, I mean, it's just a foam thing that he added the sound effects later. And that was back in the eighties and it worked. And frankly, if I saw that today, you still get what it is. That's, that is like a, a, a benchmark video. Like, yep, that's all you need. Um, <laughs> I do have a lot of inventors that will come and say, you know, I'm, I'm working this out. I'm working on the patent. And then say, honestly, I, I don't need you to have any of that. As long as the idea is cool, we will take it from there. We will work it out with you. As long as you can explain why it is more interesting than something else that a consumer might buy or might already be on the market. Um, if you're talking, to, you're talking kind of more in materials, uh, cardboard, paper, foam, if you want to get really into it it's nice if you can have um if you got something clever that a 3d printer can do i will say you know you'd be surprised if you are a new inventor like how easy and affordable it is lately to get someone to put something together for you and 3d print it you know but but truthfully those are always nice they are not 100 percent necessary like don't let your idea falter because you don't feel that you can express it um, or that you couldn't express it without a, a super expensive 3D model. You can absolutely do it, fake it with a video. You know, when it comes to the toys, it, and, even, toys even and games, a, though, it's like you said, it's not very hard. I know even at the Shy Tag that people play, they do the Young Inventors Challenge, and all the students are creating games out of cardboard, Play Doh, whatever sure. it is. <laughs> uh, but they're able to go through and actually validate these ideas. You know. All of us should be doing that is validating it through play testing, making sure the the ratios of your cards work or the math behind it works. So that's got to be a, a vital part 
to do your homework <laughs> a little bit yeah. before you <laughs> sit across the you table. You definitely want to play it. And the thing that I often recommend is sometimes I get really excited about it, really get fired up about the idea, and then at some point put it away, go to bed, go do something else, and come back to it after like a long weekend and look at that sketchbook and go like, was I still, I mean, I do this professionally. I'm like, this is a great design. This is an awesome theme. It's totally going to work. And then you come back to it just because I've been in meetings for three or four days. Why did I ever think that was going to be cool? I can't even remember why I bothered to write this down. This is a waste of notebook paper. You have that. The other one that I often challenge people is occasionally, you know, play it with your family or your friends because you, you need to see how they do it. Um, and when they tell you at the end of that, like, yeah, that's cool. I would buy that. Immediately offer to sell it to them. <laughs> <laughs> like if you know if you like I've got my games said yeah I would play this okay I'll I'll sell it to you for twenty dollars if they kind of get sheepish they only sort of meant that they would buy it <laughs> um, <laughs> get the in, approval in from all serious grandma that's, that's what we've heard sorry get the approval from somebody other than grandma is what is what we've heard <laughs> get that approval but the, I mean where where a lot of that comes from is sometimes you have an inventor that will really get stuck on an idea and that idea may be great and it needs more refinement but uh, you know again new caution new inventor advice don't go don't get into toy and game invention for the money yes you may strike it rich um, I would rec if that's your plan I would recommend lottery tickets as, a, as an equally viable option because the odds are relatively similar but the you know people that are successful in this are prolific. They're they are not doing it to typically to sell one beautiful idea. They're doing it to to try and bring these many great ideas that they have to life. Be prolific, um, shed many toy you know or, or, or share many toy concepts and game concepts. Um, cast that net wide because you know odds are all of your ideas are probably pretty good. Um, sometimes it just takes the right marriage to get it out there. Um, but we've seen just as many great ideas not do well, and we've been surprised at how well some great ideas did. So so when, when inventors are, are putting together their idea, one of the, the things that, you know, that I've seen, I've worked with a lot of inventors in other industries as well, is the tendency to never type their idea into Google prior or to maybe research the company they're wanting to to pitch to. You want to touch on that a little bit? Like what uh, what is the responsibility of the inventor there? Sure. That that's that is a good one. Again, good good new inventor advice. Um, you do want to do that Google search. Uh, I have been asked a lot, like, what are good places to look? Um, I would start if you are a toy inventor. Um, I mean, you can. It, you can Google toy companies and then look at those toy companies and look at their offerings and whatever your idea is. It's a left-handed sprocket widget. Okay, you've got your left-handed sprocket widget. Google left-handed sprocket widgets. Then Google left-handed widgets that sprocket. Then sprockets that widget with both hands. Then right-handed sprocket other variations of yours to see a if it's out there and b um, you know if, if if it is out there what you might be bringing new to the table it's easy to fall into the risk of let me make sure that no one's done what i've done cursory search not immediately seeing what i've done we can move on that's generally not a good idea um, and a better place to start even from that is to decide to yourself, I want, I have a lot, you know, I have creative passion burning within me and it didn't work in my line of tie-dyed dog clothes, which might work. You, no one can have that, by the way. That's mine. <laughs> but I want to do it in toys and games. Go where toys and games are sold. Don't be creepy about it, but you can stand in the toy and game aisle of Target, especially around the holidays, and you will see parents, you will see children, you will see what they're buying, what they're looking at. Um, you can go onto the bestseller list at Amazon and you can change that. Now, that's not necessarily what's going to be trending. That's often what's trending right now. But you can get an idea for what is out there already in the world. I, I had a sculpture professor that for years his mantra was get a clue. 
And what he meant was when you were doing sculpt, like go to museums, go see what people are doing, let it inspire you, but also be aware of what's being done in that space. Um, so that not only are you, and, and not even just from the, the standpoint of uh, play, you know, the, the risk of plagiarism or kind because that's actually, believe it or not, that, that is a far separate issue. It's more about just being inspired and being aware of how children are playing, how adults are playing. If you are a gamer, I would also recommend Board Game Geek. Kickstarter is a great one, and I don't mean go on there and look up toys. I mean, go to the design section or the tech section or the cartoon section, and you look at the things that are really blowing up, that will give you a good indication of what people are, what sort of firing people's imagination at the moment. So what do you like best about working in the industry? What's your, uh, what's your favorite part? What stands out? Oh. <laughs> that bad, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's fantastic. I, I would. There's nothing else that I want to do with my life. Um, it's. It is really tough when I am. When I am, it's. It's a really tough call. The industry isn't really tough. I love what I do. It can be frustrating. It's a job. There are parts, but in general, I. I it's. It, it, it's. It's two hats. When I am at home, when I'm doing. Design, I love the design. I love that I get to take some idea that I found or that was brought into the company or one of my colleagues found and we thought it was cool and I get to tinker with it and solve design problems and play it with people and figure out, you know, just the process of going, what's going to make this cool? Um, you know, as I, as I move further on in my career and I have very talented designers that I work with, I often joke now that, you know, I, a big part of me that wishes I could do more of that. You know, I'm gazing wistfully at them working on their sketchboards as I go to a budget meeting, something to that <laughs> effect. But, you know, that's, that's life. Um, but then on the other hand, it's the people. I love, I love being in event relations. I love traveling to the different shows. I love meeting these bizarro folks that decided one day, okay, computers are cool, so is dry cleaning, but I'm choosing toys and games. And I've got <laughs> some ideas. And even if it's not a, a good idea for me, or if it's uh, even an idea that needs some work, um, you know, I have to hand it to inventors and creatives. Uh, your prototype may be lousy, your game may vary, your toy concept might, you might find out that uh, you, you know, somebody else had done it a while ago, but at least you made something, at least you got out there and, and, and you know, put your heart into it and, and went the distance, like, I, you know, I've never written a great American novel. So um, <laughs> meeting people that chose to do that, whatever else they may be doing in life, they gave it the old college try and at least tried to create something really fun. Meeting those people and doing design, it's always a toss up between those two. I am happy as a clam in either role. Uh, the trans it's a rare industry is where you tough. can get out of the show, get out of your meetings and then go go play games at the pub until three in the morning <laughs> with your competitors. <laughs> Which is definitely a big part of uh, the, the fun of traveling. Yeah. But even that, you know, uh, playing games with colleagues, playing games with, um, with other inventors, it's, it's terrific. So inversely uh, to your favorite things in the industry of play, what is, what, is there anything that you just don't like? What's, what's the hard about working in the industry of play? What, what don't I like? Um, <laughs> what don't I like? Some, sometimes, if I'm being perfectly honest, you, you can get bogged down just kind of the day-to-day. -day. Anyone who is watching this, uh, unless you've been hiding in a cave, or I actually shouldn't be insulting because I go through chunks of time where I just avoid the news. So if you are, we'll assume, avoiding the news, you may possibly have missed that there is a global supply crisis, um, supply and logistics and labor shortages, um, and it's causing a lot of problems. And dealing with that, those kind of logistical, I have a lot of respect for the people within my company. They're having to deal with it firsthand. They're losing a lot of sleep. They're logging in a lot of hours. They're really putting it in. And those, I mean, there's no way around it. Those aren't enjoyable. 
Um, granted, global pandemics that shut things down for a year and a half, give or take, uh, are uncommon. But there are always going to be those kind of problems. You do have to deal with that sort of stuff. So it's handling that side. But the truth is, I don't think anybody enjoys that. I think you do it because it's part of the effort to get your product out in the world. You do it because you have to, to get back to the thing that you love. The next time somebody's there at the shelf looking at the box that's got the toy or the game inside of there, you <laughs> got to consider that there was somebody in a logistics meeting trying to get that out of a factory into a container uh, and that a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into getting that into a stocking. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's a pain. And the other one that drives me nuts is when I read a review because the internet is always a good place to go and ask for people's anonymous opinions when you want to feel good about yourself. <laughs> um, don't do that. But you see comments like, oh, it could have been like five more cents of plastic. You're like, okay, you have no idea what you're talking about. You just, you hush. You have no idea what, the, what it takes to get that out there. <laughs> um, but at the same time, myself and other, and, and uh, again, peers and colleagues in the industry, we all have a number of great stories where you're out somewhere, you meet someone and some family, some little kid. It happened to me. I was on vacation in June. And we just were talking, we were waiting in line for some attraction at an amusement park um, and just shooting the breeze. Someone found out, well, you know, when you say what you do, everybody's like, oh, you were. And, and then they, maybe they know Ravensburger, maybe they don't think, well, maybe they don't. But at some point they catch on to a product and they're like, oh, we love that game. We play that game. Did you do this one? And I'm like, ah, oh, actually, I did design that. Or I worked with the inventor on that. Or I brought that one in. You like that? You know, and then you're looking at this little eight-year-old and get a little emotional and you're like, and you like that game? And he's like, yeah, that's so cool. We played this. We did this thing where we built this thing out of it because this thing that you made. And I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep at it. I'll keep at it. I can handle the logistics issues for that. Nice. That's why we do it. <laughs> that's exactly right. So uh, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> what am I going to be when I grow? Honestly, um, I think I, I would like to cross the table. At some, I love what I do. I really do. But at some point, I'm, I want to say, let me, let me see if I can just invent some stuff. I say that, and people that I work with are always like, well, you can sort of do that now. I mean, I, technically I could. Um, but I, I enjoy where I am. And also, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a job. Yeah, you, know, you got to put in the nine to fiver, and then the uh, five to like six thirty or seven or. Um, let's let's call it a retirement <laughs> plan for now. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. At some point, I feel like I'll. You know, my wife calls them my retirement jobs. They're pipe dreams. I say, okay, as soon as money is not an object, and I'm still alive, I'll go ahead and start inventing. <laughs> I, stra I on, uh, you know, I, I, I jest, of course, but honestly, at, at some point, I fantasize that I'll cross the table and be an inventor. We'll see. Well, Josh, this has been, uh, this has been great kind of mm -hmm. diving in and discussing, um, especially the point of view from the, I guess the side of the table that is they're rejecting ideas and rejecting ideas and Over. rejecting <laughs> ideas until all of a sudden it's like, yes, that's the one we want. Um, so you are, you know, the squasher of dreams, but also the maker of dreams. Uh, for certain people, so I do appreciate the insights that you're that you're sharing. Uh, but before we go, Happy to do before it. we go, we want to just uh, throw a couple of rapid fire uh, hidden roll questions at you here. So rapid fire away. Yeah, we're gonna roll this roll that beautiful and whatever bean footage. It lands on. We'll ask a question corresponding to the symbol. All right, so we'll see what we get okay. here. All right, lightning bolt. Um, and you may be biased, but what genre needs more games? What genre yeah. needs more wow. games? Ooh, that's a tough one. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I've got to think about this one a minute. What genre needs more games? You're going to get buzzed here. I know, I know, I know it's a lightning <laughs> round. Honestly, um, 
I mean, I, I am biased. I prefer old school kind of history, uh, historic, a little bit of fantasy. Um, but I think, but there's plenty of those. And so that's where I'm, that's where I'm struggling because I think which one needs more games is probably more lighthearted, sort of easygoing cooperative games that everyone can relate to what they're doing. Um, so you can get just enough of that escapist fantasy, but still kind of knock it out. You know, I might like to try some other form of endeavor that is real and concurrent to here. I kind of want to be a pirate or maybe a shipbuilder or a <laughs> banker or something like that, but do it in a fun way that I can experience it with nachos. <laughs> so more fun pirate eating nacho games. Perfect. Now, all right, let's go again. Anything that you can play while eating. Dollar sign, Dollar sign. If money were no object, what game would you build or make? What game would I build or make? I have a small notebook of ideas that I keep, and I would take any one of those. My issue is that I tend to start with themes, and my themes need good mechanics. Um, if money were no object, I would want to do something with lots of dice, lots of miniatures, but that true to my think fun roots does a thing. In other words, like it has <laughs> a, a mechanical bang, a function. Fun, fun dice exactly. Game. <laughs> exactly. Nice. If you remember like crossbows and catapults that actually had things that would move, something like that, oh, yeah. but there would be a little more strategy to it. <laughs> I miss that. I rely yeah. so much on aim. I did right, this because that was the final question. Cyclops. Oh. Type of thing. Ooh, the broken heart. What game or game kind of genre do you just love to hate? <laughs> do I just love to hate? Um, there is a limit for me on games where or I, I, I definitely hit a wall on specifically the social games where you take turns being the judge. Um, <laughs> I've played a lot of good games in this and I do and I and, and they're fun. They're fun when you have the right people and they're fun based on timing. But there's definitely a point where I kind of go, okay, no, I'll play that because everyone in the group wants to and I will be a sport and I love it. But are you sure you don't want to make something where we can place some workers? Huh? A little strategy? Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just need something goofy games. to mess with. But <laughs> those, those, there's a limit for me, for me personally. <laughs> So, Josh, a couple of things before we go. Uh, one, where's the best place to, to follow, I guess, ThinkFun uh, website or things you're working on? And uh, can you give us any insight to any things new coming, like any any good would, juicy bits? Would that are be happy annoying? to. Would be happy to. Um, definitely good to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, ThinkFun, and then RNA, Ravensburger, North America. Lots of new stuff coming out. Um, I'll get in a plug for the greater company. We've got some great new games planned for Gen Con, kind of the bigger, broader stuff. Um, some of our licensed items, new Villainous, new Horrified, um, new Gargoyles games for those of you that are 90s cartoon kids that kept the TV on a uh, like, little bit before Batman, the animated series, or after. <laughs> anyway, um, we have some great new items coming up, two in particular that I'm excited to get out into the world Um our geologic, it's a really neat puzzle based around the globe and has uh, these neat pieces that you click on and it's an assembly puzzle that done as a three-dimensional globe. Um, we have a, a, a new one that actually we, we just released. It's out now. It's called Cold Case. Um, it's very approachable, quick, fun, interactive, low price point, uh, $15, I believe, somewhere in that area. Um, but you just, it's, it's a, it's a neat interactive thing where you, you read the story, you read, uh, it's, it's for an older crowd, autopsy reports, witness statements, that kind of thing on a fictional cold case that has not been solved. And you try to solve those. You can buy the first one on Amazon. We've got a line of them coming out, um, though shipping delays. So trying to get those out as quick as we can. Um, and then we have a neat one called Dragon Falls. It, it's a really, uh, it's beautifully sculpted. It's very well illustrated. And the concept was really unique. It is a, what we would call in puzzle language, a path building puzzle or path completion puzzle. Um, where, where we flip the script on this one, in this case, literally, is rather than have it in two dimensions moving around 
the board stands vertically and the dragons go on both sides and it weaves back and forth. Um, and the plot here is it is a three-dimensional waterfall in a stone basin and there is a coral dragon and, an, and a kelp dragon, I believe is what we finally decided on that. And they have heads and tails. They are serpents or serpentine and you have different lengths of those serpents and they weave back and forth over the waterfall and the puzzle is that you are given the head and the tail and some assemblage of pieces and some rocks that get in the way and you have to complete them so that both dragons or one dragon, if there's only one in the puzzle, is one full set from head to tail. And yes, this is a shameless plug because David, him, you are the inventor. <laughs> well, um, thanks for, <laughs> what's thanks for that? throwing that out there. Jeez. Well, again... I can't thank you enough for coming on and and sharing your story and giving thank me you for uh, having me. Yeah, for sure, and giving some insights, uh, some good good tips to those uh, those starting inventors and uh, for those veteran inventors. It's also good to hear hear those things as well. So, at some point, I think that would be a fun conversation to have. Uh, you know, to somehow get uh, you know maybe get a roundtable going of like, okay, what advice would you give to veteran inventors? Because I have some, and that's definitely a different conversation. Well, um, the next time we have you on here, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Sweet. I'm Again, there. thanks there. for uh, thanks for listening to Hidden Roll, and uh, until next time, play some games. Yeah. This has been Hidden Roll, the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. If you like what we're doing, the best way you can support us is to share us with your favorite brains. Please thumbs up, leave a review, and follow Hidden Roll Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. You can also sign up for our newsletter at www.hiddenrollpodcast.com for a monthly sneak peek at our upcoming content. That's Hidden Roll, R-O-L-E, podcast.com. Our episodes are available on all major listening platforms, or if you'd like to see our beautiful faces, all of our content is available to watch on YouTube. If you know of someone who would be a great fit to appear in our podcast, or if you'd like to learn the story behind any toy or game, send us an inquiry at hiddenrollpodcast.com forward slash suggestions. Or let us know on our social media. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. Once again, special thanks to Pop, People of Play, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Visit www.peopleofplay.com to learn more. This podcast is also made possible by the continued support of the brains who never grew up, inventors of play, Streamline Design. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.